And our last speaker in the session is Dr. Silver. We'll be speaking about rehabilitation and prehabilitation. Great, thank you so much. Slides are coming. Excellent presentation so far and, and a, a really nice segue into um, rehabilitation and prehabilitation. Um, there's a lot of really great people in the room. Um, some of you I've met previously, some of you I'm seeing on social media, which is really fun. It's always, there's always this conversation that happens above the conversation, right, on social media, which is really fun to see. Do I need to do anything to get the slides up or are you working on it? Okay. Um, do you need my flash? Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So um, one of the things I was thinking about, and I'm going to talk a lot about um, the field of uh, rehabilitation medicine. It's a well-established field. Um, it started actually um, around the time of World War II when we had hundreds of thousands of injured military personnel coming, um, and they came back from war. And they had all these physical and cognitive um, and, you know, and psychological problems. And basically, this whole field of physical medicine and rehabilitation started then. And so um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that means and what it doesn't mean, because it's actually a really well-established field where there are doctors who are trained like me, um, where there are physical therapists and occupational therapists and speech therapists and rehabilitation nurses and rehabilitation psychologists and so on. And there are uh, very specific training criteria, board certification, licensure, and that's actually um, those services when they're provided are reimbursed by third party payers. So I want to really um, focus a lot on what this means. And I'm going to start by telling tell you a little bit about what it doesn't really mean. So one of the things that happened in oncology is that when the really wonderful um, IOM report, um, uh, you know, Lost in Translation came out, is people said, oh my gosh, we need to start paying attention to all these survivor needs. And um, the cardiac rehab model was sort of kind of adopted in oncology. And the cardiac rehab model is actually really different the way it works in oncology versus um, cardiology. Here's how it works in cardiology. So the cardiologist um, identifies the impairment in the patient. It's usually one problem or one system, the cardiovascular system. That cardiologist works with an interdisciplinary team on site in a medical facility and manages that one problem together with a fitness professional, exercise physiologist, et cetera. And so the care is really quite good and quite safe, and, and it's a really great model. Now, what happens when the oncologist switches and becomes the, the cardiologist? Now the oncologist is managing lots of impairments in almost every system of the body, and that referral may be out into the community and not really, it may be an interdisciplinary team, but it's not like a cohesive interdisciplinary team that's all working together on site. In the meantime, the impairments are not getting treated. So when you have a lot of impairments, there's very specific healthcare professionals that focus on impairments that's it's within their scope of practice. And that's really what I want to talk about is how the impairments get treated. Now, sometimes when I talk, People say, oh, she's saying exercise is important, is not important. She's saying nutrition is not important. She's saying this. That's not what I'm saying. They're really important, super important. In fact, they fit into the care continuum so nicely. What I'm saying is don't forget to treat the impairments from the med medical personnel that are really trained to treat those impairments. All right, so let's talk about impairments. You know, we had this study, 163 women um, who had uh, metastatic breast cancer. You know, how many impairments did they have, et cetera? You know, 92% had impairments, no surprise, right? And 530 impairments were documented. So it means they had more than one impairment, most of them. That's no surprise. And here's the thing that's interesting. I'm, I'm um, editing a journal um, supplement on cancer rehabilitation right now. And one of the um, authors that submitted a paper said, oh, as cancer treatments get better and better, there's less need for rehabilitation because the cancer treatments are so much better and the patients are surviving longer. I'm like, I don't think that's true. The patients are surviving longer at the cost of cumulative of effects of treatment. I, I'm not, you know, we, ha we don't have the data to show that exactly, but what you just said doesn't quite make sense. So less than 2% were treated. Wow, that's a lot of people who are going untreated. Okay, 
So study 529 older adults, 341 had um, potentially modifiable impairment. So I want to really highlight this, potentially modifiable. There's suffering in cancer, a lot of suffering. You can't get rid of it. There's suffering. It's always going to be there. And there's unnecessary suffering. And I want to talk about unnecessary suffering. I'm not talking about all suffering. And I'm not talking about all survivorship services. I'm talking about unnecessary suffering, specifically treating impairments and cancer rehabilitation and how it does it. So 9% received treatment. Wow. So we know from study after study, the majority of cancer survivors have impairments and need rehabilitation. And most of them never get this treatment. And we have lots of studies that link it to distress and physical, the, the physical and psychological. So the more patients sort of can get back to their lives and, and feel as strong as possible physically, the less distressed they tend to be, right? So one of the things I did was I, I sat down with some of my colleagues who work in cancer rehabilitation, and we talked about this really big disconnect in the literature where um, you know, oncologists in particular are being, um, they're, they're not, they don't really, um, the, the literature isn't reflecting what the real field of cancer rehabilitation is. So the journal CA invited me and some other um, cancer rehab physicians to write a very specific article on impairment-driven cancer rehabilitation and really talk about impairments. Now, if you're on the rehab side of things, you say, well, what about the ICF um, WHO classification? And what about this, this, and this? And I'm like, wait a second. We just want to bring um, oncologists and others back to medical school and talk about impairments. How do you treat a patient with an impairment? What do you do? And so that actually was taken and, and inserted into the ACS facts and figures for the first time ever, which was really great. And then it's been continued to be used. So, one of the big things we wanted to just do is, is really get people to say, okay, wait, if I'm sitting there and I know a patient may have impairments, how am I going to screen for those? And then how am I going to treat them? So we started to see all kinds of definitions come about. One major organization, one more major oncology organization, I don't want to really call people or call organizations out because I think they do fantastic work, but they gave a description of cancer rehabilitation, and they included couples counseling and marriage counseling as, as one of the core components of it. And they left out um, doctors like me, physical medicine and rehabilitation, and they left out other core components, but they included marriage counseling and couples counseling. And I can tell you that marriage counseling and couples counseling is super important, but I can also tell you it's not cancer rehabilitation. It doesn't mean that, that patients don't have problems. Of course they may, but to say to a surgeon, surgeon, under your, the description of your work, we're going to put marriage and couples counseling as what you do. It's like, no, surgeons don't do marriage and couples counseling. It doesn't mean they don't think it's important. They also put genetic testing. OK, that's really important. I mean, everybody in this room is going to say, genetic testing is so important. It doesn't mean it's, it's um, cancer rehabilitation. Another organization, really big organization, listed, it, listed things, and they put Reiki and chiropractic care. Well, those are complementary and alternative medicine or integrative medicine interventions, and, and they can complement cancer rehabilitation. But in fact, in patients um, who have metastatic disease or significant osteoporosis from multiple cancer treatments, that can actually be very dangerous. So we would never say to a cancer survivor, oh, we gave you marriage counseling, so you've had cancer rehabilitation. That doesn't really make sense. So we wanted to have really n define cancer rehabilitation based on a very long history of definitions that are in the literature, especially in the rehabilitation literature. OK, so let's talk about prehabilitation. So there's this opportunity right when a cancer patient is diagnosed to get them ready. And if you talk about if you think about prehabilitation and how it evolved, it actually evolved too from the war scenario. So what happened was that all these military recruits were going to go over and fight. But guess what? 
a lot of them came from backgrounds where they weren't very athletic, they didn't have good nutrition, et cetera. So they start imp imp started implementing boot camps. And they started saying, okay, if we get people more physically ready for a big upcoming stressor, they'll probably do better. So that's really where prehabilitation came from, actually. It's really interesting if you go back. And so I wrote the first review on cancer prehabilitation in the medical literature, bringing together all the information that was available at that time. And that really started to get people interested in this idea of prehabilitation. Like, what could we do at the beginning? And I, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that. One of the things I did after I did that review is this, this researcher in Montreal said, hey, Julie Silver, I see you're talking about cancer prehabilitation and you really seem to understand this. How about if we get like the 10 people in the world together who've written about this, who really seem to understand that, we bring them to Montreal, we have a subject matter experts group, and we really define it and we, and we share information about how the research should go and how the field should go. So we did that, that was in 2015. And that was really a lot of fun and super interesting. We literally sat at a table and then we invited people to stand around and watch us sort of talk about this. And we struggled with a lot of things. Um, and, and I won't go too much into it, but you know, there's, some, there's a lot of issues that come up in that. So then we got together just in June again, and this time we invited like 100 experts to come and talk more about it. And there's so many people that said, wow, that was the best conference I've ever been to. It was so interesting and so engaging, and there was such huge potential for prehabilitation. So, this is David Storto. He is the president of the Spalding Rehabilitation Network at Harvard Medical School and Partners. And there he is, and he's crossing the finish line of the Boston Marathon this year. Right? How did he do that? Did he just get up that day and say, I think I'm going to go run the Boston Marathon? Did he start like 24 to 72 hours in advance, the perioperative period? Or did he start way in advance, as far in advance as he could? Well, yeah, he started way in advance to try to really optimize. So thinking about definitions and really getting them right and thinking about how they can reduce morbidity and potentially even mortality has been something that I've focused a lot of my work on. So let's think about prehabilitation. I like to use the marathon um, analogy, especially with surgeons. Surgeons really, really, really get this because they've developed these awesome protocols called enhanced recovery programs, or ERAS, or ERAS, depending on who you talk to, but ERAS protocols. And they're like in that perioperative period. And they call, they're called fast track studies. or what, I mean, they're just so great. I love them. And they love them. Surgeons love them. So you get a surgeon in, in a room, and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, prehab goes right with your early recovery programs. It makes so much sense. Just back it up to as, as soon as you can, you know, after diagnosis, get that patient as, as prepared as you can, and then offer them whatever post-operative treatment they need to. So you have to know, though, what's going to happen to the patient. Like, you can't, you can't develop these protocols if you don't know the problems that they're going to face. So for example, this woman comes up to me, and she's, she's a survivor. She says, Dr. Silver, I so appreciated the talk that you gave. I'm really one of those fortunate people. Um, I had head and neck cancer, and um, I never had any rehab, but I'm just, I'm just so fortunate that I don't have problems. And I said, oh. I said, well, you know, if you've never had rehab, I probably could stand across the room and diagnose a problem that you could have, potentially. And she goes, Really what? And I go, I don't even need to touch you, but just turn your head like this. And she couldn't, of course. And I said, well, how do you drive? And she goes, oh, well, I use mirrors. And I have all these mirrors, and I do this. And I'm like, OK, well, if you had rehab, you probably could turn your neck, because when you have head and neck cancer, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the cervical region. And physical therapy to increase cervical range of motion can do wonders for your ability to function. And I like your mirror solution, right? But that's adaptive. How about trying to get your cervical range of motion back as soon as you possibly can before all the scar tissue adheres and everything else. She was like, oh my gosh, like no one even ever said that. So if you're thinking about head and neck cancer, then you gotta, you gotta know what, what they cut. In fact, I was talking to a, um, um, a uh, journalist and she said to me, she goes, all right, I get the head and neck cancer example, but I don't understand like breast cancer. Let's take the breast cancer. I don't get it. Like why, why would women need to do anything except exercise? 
And so I started describing a mastectomy with a tram flap reconstruction. And you know what she said to me? She said, you got to stop. You're making me nauseous. I didn't put pictures in here of what they look like because this is a mixed group. Um, and I don't want people to get nauseous or to be really uncomfortable. But let me tell you that there are a lot of problems when you cut into skin and muscle and tissue and all kinds of things. So start at the beginning. You've got to know what's going on. You've got to know the end goal. You've got to know how that patient is going to end up or what's most likely. And we know that from the literature. We actually do. And then you work backwards. You remember in organic chemistry, for those of you who took it, you had this um, you know, chemical compound. You had to create this. And then you had to know the steps in between. That's all we're doing here. So, and guess what? Here's some good news. What if, instead of the new normal, the new normal being worse than you were before, what if you were actually better off than you were before? OK, that's a game changer, right? And it's not possible for everyone, certainly. But what if there's a population of cancer survivors that actually were physically and emotionally better off after cancer than they were before? Is that impossible? No, it's actually not. So let's talk about lung cancer. What do we know about lung cancer? Leading cause of cancer-related death, high mortality, et cetera. We also know we have this new screening protocol that's being um, paid for by Medicare, et cetera. Um, you know, low-dose scre uh, screening is kind of like, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's kind of like um, having mammograms come out where all of a sudden we're going to try to pick up things a little earlier in, can in lung cancer patients. It used to be that most lung cancer patients were diagnosed at the later stages, which is still true. But now there's this opportunity for those patients who have high risk to pick it up earlier. But guess what? They have to go to surgery. So there we got Tim Sherwood, and he's a thoracic surgeon, and he's saying to um, this patient, Alberta, um, who has talked about her experience quite a bit, he's saying to her, okay, Alberta, you are not ready to have a big thoracic surgery for your cancer. So either you can not have the surgery or you can do prehab. And if you don't have the surgery, here, here are the other treatments that fall into the palliative care category. But if you have surgery, you got to get a lot stronger and healthier, right? So there he is, and he operates on her after a bunch of prehab. And she was a case report that, that we wrote up. But if you look at, for example, Franco Carley's work on other people, they're showing not just an N of 1, but a little bit higher end. But not huge numbers yet, because this hasn't really taken off in a way that, um, you know, where we have huge numbers. You can't get huge numbers, though, until you actually know the problems these specific patients have and then put the right protocol in and work backwards. And the protocol can't be exercise only. It, there has to be a nutritional component, just like David Storto when he ran the marathon. He didn't just run, 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 run. He increased his protein intake and his fluids and all kinds of things, right? And then he addressed smoking, which he's not a smoker, but because, not because of cancers. Not because of cancers, but because people who smoke have worse operative outcomes with infections and all kinds of um, problems with that, right? So there's different things that you have to think about in a prehab protocol that are very specific. So we did a study just to really show that we need to actually put these services into the care continuum, and we need to um, really educate patients more about this. And so a group of physiatrists, doctors that specialize in rehabilitation medicine from different cancer centers around the country, including um, Harvard Medical School hospitals and, and MD Anderson, et cetera, we got together and we looked at all the NCI cancer center websites and we found that 90% of them did not include a link to cancer rehabilitation services. And only 8% of the websites included accurate and detailed information. So there is an actual field of cancer rehabilitation medicine. Doctors specialize in this. Other healthcare professionals specialize in this. There's tests you have to take. There, is, there um, are requirements for licensure. And it is covered by third-party payers. So how does this fit into the triple aim? Well, gee, if you can prevent certain problems from ever happening, 
or you can reduce the, the problems, it's sort of like I always tell patients, um, you know, that, that I see, it's like brushing and flossing. Like you go to the dentist and you say, okay, I never want to have another cavity. And the dentist says, well, I can't do that. Well, if you brush and floss, you'll have a lot fewer problems. Well, there are ways to help patients have a lot fewer problems. And if we know the end result and what's happening in that patient population, we can predict a lot of the problems and figure this out way sooner. So I was just um, a subject matter expert um, with a number of people who are actually here in this room on this um, NIH uh, panel. We came up with specific recommendations. This was the first time that the NIH and the NCI and the Rehab Medicine Department and NIH and so on, American Cancer Society sort of collaborated on cancer rehabilitation specific information. And the things that we came out of this there's a, a you know, fairly, not big report, but you know, it's, it's, it's a, an important report, that we looked at that, that this should be part of the care plan. Of course, the care plan, we know, is nothing if the real services aren't delivered to the patients, right? And we should be thinking about this from the time of diagnosis onward. What can we do? If we know these problems exist, what can we do? And there is a lot we can do. So thank you.